Great. So we've been looking at the book of James. We've been looking at the book of James, and it's so, so practical and also so challenging. Um, It's written very much for us to really apply our faith um, in our day-to-day lives. Um, And last week, Gary gave us a really challenging word about the words that we use and how we speak to one another, um, which I found very challenging. I don't know about you. Uh, Just to explain as well, the picture that we're using for this sermon series is um, the picture of a pawn and um, set against a mirror, and that is the king um, in the mirror. So just... It's just to say, it's an opportunity for us to reflect um, on these words and just to reflect in our own lives how we are um, reflecting the King that is Jesus. Okay, so looking at wisdom today, two kinds of wisdom, and um, you might think about that as being clever. So who is the cleverest person you can think of? Um, You might think you're pretty clever. You might have a a real um, brain buff in your family. Um, Here are some pretty clever people. I pronounced this incorrectly in the first service. So, (laughs) This one on the left, uh, Johann Goethe, I believe. This is who Einstein considered um, the last man in the world to know everything. He founded the science of human chemistry. So pretty clever chap. I feel like I'm feeding back a little bit. Um, There on the right we have Marie Curie, who is known for her research into radioactivity, resulting in the invention of the X-ray, amongst other things. She actually won the Nobel Prize twice. And on the right, I don't know who that is. No one into tech. Okay, this is Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web. Okay, so he's a pretty clever chap. How do we know that these people are clever? Well, they might have had really excellent exam results. They might have a really high IQ. Um, They may have had recognized achievements and public accolades. So we know that they're really clever because we've seen it in that way. But who is the wisest person you can think of? So I think wisdom has different emphasis, doesn't it? Uh, Perhaps people you might think of, um, famous philosophers. So Socrates, (laughs) one of his quotes was, uh, let him that would move the world first move himself. Solomon is considered um, one of the wisest in the Bible. He wrote the book of uh, Proverbs. He said, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Pretty wise. And of course, Jesus, literally everything he said and did was wise. Okay, so we can certainly learn from him. Maybe you have someone who you go to for wisdom in your life. Maybe you are that person. Um, But how do we know that these people are wise? How do we know someone carries wisdom? So the word wise coming from the word sophos. Someone who has moral insight and skill in advising on practical issues of conduct rather than academic knowledge of theoretical problems and their solution. That was a lot of words. Basically means it's not head knowledge about facts and figures. It's practical knowledge about how to live, how we live out values, how to have good relationships, how to build good, mature character. So James tells us don't be content with cleverness, with intellectual knowledge. Um, So just as we know that electricity is there, it shows itself when a light bulb is switched on, just as faith is shown in good deeds. True wisdom is shown by our conduct and in our character, how we behave. So what is on the inside is shown on the outside. This is seen throughout all the book of James. So This week, we're particularly looking how true wisdom then turns bitterness to beauty. And my favorite images about real beauty is from um, a Roald Dahl book. I think it's Twits. You might have seen this before, and I absolutely love it. I'm going to read it out. So it says, if a person has ugly thoughts, it begins to show on the face. And when that person has ugly thoughts every day, every week, every year, The face gets uglier and uglier until it gets so ugly you can hardly bear to look at it. However, the next one says, a person who has good thoughts cannot ever be ugly. You can have a wonky nose and a crooked mouth and a double chin, this is like a mirror, and stick out teeth. But if you have good thoughts, they will shine out of your face like sunbeams and you will always look lovely. I just think that is just so sweet. I'm such, such a cute represent, representation of basically what is going on in the, in the inside will certainly display somewhere 
on the outside, whether it's in your behavior or whether it's in your resting something face. <laughs> I'm not going to say that word in church. <laughs> so um, the fruit of our lives in the way it plays out, the things we say, the relationships we have, our actions will truly reveal the source of our wisdom. Um, so in this passage, James talks about two kinds of wisdom, this way or that way. So um, he speaks of earthly wisdom in verses 14 to 15. Let's just recap that one. It says, But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come, from, come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That is pretty severe. Um, I think you'll agree. That sounds really dark and pretty severe, doesn't it? Um, it really speaks um, flesh and anti-kingdom. However, in verse 17, he speaks of wisdom that comes from heaven. So verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So such extremes, they are so different, such contrast between earthly wisdom from the flesh, anti-kingdom, and wisdom that comes from heaven, which is kingdom principles and really speaks of the spirit, okay? So our understanding of wisdom will very much depend on our perception of values, our perspective, <laughs> and what we hold on to as the most important thing. Sometimes we think something is the most important thing, but our actions and our character says otherwise. So as Christians, we look to kingdom values. Um, so what does true wisdom look like? So in verse 17, it mentions um, all these positive things. It also mentions good fruit. Love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness. Does that remind you of something? It reminds me of the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so to me, this is speaking earthly wisdom from flesh, wisdom that comes from heaven, from spirit, from the Holy Spirit. Um, in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 17, uh, Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary <coughs> to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now our, our society will tell you, do what you like. Do what makes you happy. But we know a different way, don't we? Do you feel the conflict of that? Do you feel the conflict of flesh <laughs> and spirit? Because I know that I do. Just in day-to-day -day situations, um, just in my own thought life, I feel the tension of fleshy thoughts, Holy Spirit thoughts. What is evident in my life? So what is the fruit of where I'm placing my wisdom? And does flesh speak louder than spirit. Do I want flesh to speak louder than spirit? So this passage talks about harboring bitterness, envy, selfish ambition in our hearts. And are these present in my life? Are they present in your life? Something about um, bitterness, I think we can think that bitterness means in a very extreme case, like totally consumed with bitterness. But I've found that even if it's, there's a little hint of it, it can take root and really do some damage in my heart and in my relationships and how I behave. And it will, will eventually unravel somewhere. Um, but ambition isn't all bad, okay? Godly ambition is a great thing. That's another sermon for another time. <laughs> okay, so m my ambition for a long time, I'm from a musical family. Um, I just love music. I, live, I would do it all day long, every day of my life. I just love music so much. And um, this is a band, I used to be in a band called the Rio Six. And um, this was the band that I really thought, this is, I'm going to make it. This is it. <laughs> um, it was with three brilliant, brilliant guys. Uh, they were all, all Christians and just great guys, um, really talented. It was a band I always wanted to be in. And um, I thought, this is it. We were getting a little bit of uh, record label interest, a little feature in NME, if anyone's old enough to remember. <laughs> um, all very exciting. Um, and then it came to an end. And... Um, I was absolutely gutted. 
Not least because I absolutely love this bunch. Um, I used to joke that the band was my boyfriend, but that's how much love and um, focus and how much of my heart this band had. I absolutely loved them, and I was absolutely devastated. However, when that ended, I had realized that maybe I'd placed my worth in the success of this band, okay? <coughs> maybe I was pulling on earthly wisdom that told me commercial success means that you've made it and means that it's good, okay? You're doing the right thing. I sort of bought into that and I haven't realized it in my own heart. Um, so the problem with building on earthly wisdom is that then you're in a fragile place and it means you can be swayed and damaged quite easily. Whereas when we're placed on um, kingdom wisdom, it's solid, it's a solid foundation. So I was pretty devastated, it came to an end, I have been quite fragile about it, and really, really done a lot of hard work, this was a few years ago, probably about 20 years ago, and um, really done a lot of hard work, and it's, the Lord has really spoken to me about where my true identity lies, and uh, my identity certainly wasn't tied up in playing the drums with this cool bunch of blokes, um, looking quite cool, that was not where my identity is, um, and I know now that my identity is as um, a daughter of of the king, okay, and that's, and that's where um, my worth comes from. A few years down the line, and I started um, doing some songwriting, and um, this is Songs of Church, Church We Love, that's um, my little pseudonym thing, and um, doing other creative things, it, it then just nudges other parts in your heart about a related topic, okay, so the guy from the band wasn't just an awesome songwriter. I started a songwriting journey, but there was a few voices that then just started to pop up again. I thought, I thought I'd dealt with that, but it just kind of popped up a little bit again. There was a few whispers of the flesh, and the whispers of the flesh were saying, I need to be the best. I need to prove myself. Um, if I achieve this dot, 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 I know I'll be a proper songwriter. There's some quite unhelpful tools as a songwriter. When you start releasing music, this thing on the right is called Spotify for Artists, and it's addictive, and it's not that great. <laughs> so the problem with having these tools are when you're getting a lot of people listening, a lot of likes and all that, you can feel puffed up and think, ooh, I'm good, everything's going well. When these figures are not so impressive, <laughs> 17 listeners, I'm, I'm damaged and I'm, and I'm fragile and I've, it's now put me into question, am I, do I have worth because of these, um, these measures? So these little whispers can just come back. Um, comparison, those kind of lies. But the Lord has really, really walked me through this and shown me a better way, which is based on his wisdom, not on earthly wisdom. Because if I let, continue to allow those whispers to speak, it really creates bitterness from misplaced wisdom, that I haven't achieved the things that I thought that I needed to. So as the Holy Spirit has been working my life, I continue to address it when it pops up. He's taught me that my gifts work best in community. He's taught me that um, he has gifted me for exactly what he has called me to do. It's taught, he's taught me I can celebrate with someone else's success. I don't need to feel threatened by it. I can genuinely feel joy for them. Um, there is room for everyone at the table. Comparison steals joy and sows jealousy. Um, success in God's eyes is obedience and he takes care of the end result. Um, if I, I am formed to his likeness by spending time with him by myself and then this overspills into every part of my life, including my songwriting. So he's taught me that there's, that there's a shift. Depending on where I'm placing my value, there's a shift as to where my focus is. I don't need to worry about the end result because I'm plugged into king, kingdom wisdom. So true wisdom is rooted in a regular decision to choose spirit over flesh, God's way over human ways, the fruit of which is evident to others, comes out in our faces. So what is the source of our wisdom? What is the source of my wisdom? Looking at our own lives. <clears throat> and what is the fruit is it earthly, flesh, or is it heavenly, spirit? And just a little thought about selfish ambition. I mean, my ambition was tied up in something obvious like being successful in music. So that's quite an obvious one. It might be a bit more hidden for you. Selfish ambition might look like um, looking after our own needs and our own wants before others because that is promoting ourselves before others. 
Okay, so that might, it might look different for you. Okay, feels like there's a lot going on there. <laughs> I may feel like, oh, gosh, I've got, got work to do. But aren't we all on a journey? We're all on a journey. And um, the Lord is so gracious just to take us where we're at and just all the time be inviting us to come to him. He's so gracious. Let's, so let's not stay there. How about the opposites of bitterness and selfish ambition and envy? Because we can sow seeds that come from the source of true wisdom. I just wanted to share an example of a community um, that I've experienced that I think has, has shown that. So um, anyone who's spoken to me about songwriting, just the next one, Matt. Anyone who's spoken to me about songwriting, well, it's not too long before I mentioned writing worship. And writing worship is um, a community of writers who are so intentional about um, sowing um, being like the anti-self-ambition, sowing good soil and sowing good kingdom principles. Um, it's a great example of turning potential bitterness and competitiveness amongst creatives to something beautiful. Anyone who, who is creative probably has experienced the competition that exists, um, whether it's um, in art or music or acting or anything like that, there is, seems to be a natural competitiveness which really comes from our own doubt, self-doubts. So it's not, it's not rooted in a good place. But this is a great example. And the reason is, at the start of this, um, it's being part of writing worship, uh, we go through this mentorship course. And she shares, Chrissy Nordoff, who uh, heads this up, she shares the creed of the jewels. I'm just going to sh- read through them quickly. Um, I think you'll, hope, I'm hoping you'll appreciate where they're coming from. <coughs> so this is um, a creed, like an agreement of the writing worship community. All these creative songwriters, worship songwriters, are kind of signing up for this. And it says, I will, sp- whoop, I will speak blessings. I will honour others, the church and the music industry. I will be a champion for others. I will cheer others on, remembering we are building the same kingdom. Next one. I will be teachable. I will not be easily offended, but open to loving shepherding that is for my good. I will commit to a clean heart. I know that my heart affects my family, my community, my songs, and the greater church. You can maybe replace songs with something else for yourself. I will be humble. I will see each opportunity as a blessing and not something I am titled to. I will seek Jesus first, even above things that seem like good things, like my dreams. I will strive only to make God famous, not myself. I believe that music is a tool God has given me to expand his kingdom, and that is my desire. Okay, there's um, hundreds of, hundreds of <laughs> worship songwriters who have kind of signed up for that. And um, I've been to a conference and been in the same room as people who, who are buying into that. And to see that in action is something very beautiful. Um, that bitterness is, is, hid, is, is um, dealt with and not present. And there's the beauty of actual, real, genuine community, genuine cheering one another on, and a genuine making space for one another. It's a, it's a powerful thing. So, but doesn't that sound like the kingdom of God? Those, those the parts of the creed, doesn't it sound like the kingdom and how, how we should operate? Um, there's a phrase, um, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, meaning you become who you spend time with. So that's also a reference to family likeness as well. Um, we know who we belong to. Perhaps there's family likenesses. Um, I said this person's incorrect. Goethe, there we go. <laughs> Once said, tell me with whom you consort and I will tell you who you are. If I know how you spend your time, then I know what might become of you. We become what we surround ourselves with. Um, if anyone's read John Mark Comer's books or heard him speak, he very much speaks about that we are being formed all the time uh, by the relationships that we have, by what we expose ourselves to. You know, I'm conscious of, like, Instagram reels. You know, I'm being formed by sometimes the junk that, <laughs> that I've watched myself. We're being formed all the time, either intentionally or unintentionally. But the reality is our habits and what we value what we give time to very much shapes who we are and how we behave. Um, And just to say the wisdom is a gift, not just for in the moment, but to be woven into our lives, to shape us to become more like Christ. It's not just a one-time thing, Lord, should I apply for this job? 
Um, is it right that I marry, marry this person? It's not just in these, these odd um, moments. Wisdom is something that is a gift for us to shape and become more Christ-like through our lives. So there seems like a lot, there's a lot to work on, <laughs> personally. Um, and sometimes you can feel like, oh gosh, I feel now quite conscious of my fleshy bits, the bits that aren't um, led by the Spirit, the bits that are quite fleshy. And it's uncomfortable. And so how do I deal with it? What, what do we do? I've just got a little video I'd like to um, talk with. So you might have seen something like this before. Here we are. There we go. <laughs> So we've got um, a cup of dirty water. And all that's happening is the clean water is just washing through it. You can see already it started to dilute and dilute and dilute. And it's washing it clean. It's washing it clean. Okay? So how can we shift? How can we correct um, where we may have built our lives on earthly wisdom? And basically the answer is always Jesus. (laughs) We need more of God. We need to allow him in more and more. We need more of his Holy Spirit. Um, Because otherwise, we're just fleshy. So for true wisdom, we need to go to the true source of all wisdom. A couple of practical things would be to read his word. This, you know, the Lord has already spoken wisdom. (laughs) It, this is full, God, the, God's already spoken wisdom in here. Um, I think the more, the more we get to know it and get it into our understanding and into our behaviours, then we are then becoming formed by it. Another practical thing is look at the book of Proverbs, which has some really specific, you just a, ch- a chunk at a time, have some really specific examples of wisdom that we can apply to our lives. But it's not us that produces the fruit. It is produced in us as we submit and yield to the Holy Spirit's work in us. John 15 says, apart from, uh, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We can do things by our own efforts, but it's not, it's not going to have um, heavenly fruit. It's not going to have fruit of the Spirit because it's not plugged in to him. So just, I'd like to just make a bit of space just to think about that and just to respond. Um, yeah, just a sec. 